Today, our psalm is Psalm 130, and this psalm expresses deep longing for God's attention to our great need for forgiveness and redemption. It also expresses great confidence in the hope that we place in God. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who, re who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. And then turning to the Gospel of Matthew, we read this morning Matthew chapter 26, verses 1 through 13. In the Gospel of Matthew's narrative of the, event, of the events leading to Jesus' passion, we read here of Jesus' own prediction of what lies ahead for him, as well as of a woman's recognition of Jesus as one worthy of extravagant worship. Listen for God's word. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the son of man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, and they conspired to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. Now, while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were angry and said, why this waste? For this ointment could have been sold for a large sum and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. By pouring this ointment on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you, where, wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Thanks be to God for these readings from God's holy word. Our third scripture this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans in the eighth chapter, beginning with the 31st verse. Listen for what God is saying to us in these words of holy scripture. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open our hearts, O oh God, 
open our minds, open our ears to hear what you are saying to us today through these words of Holy Scripture, that hearing we might know how we are to be in this troubled world. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. There are a lot of questions in the Bible. Some of the questions are famous, like, what is truth? Which was asked by Pontius Pilate. Or as the psalmist asked, how long, O Lord? And my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But this week, the biblical question that has been constantly running in the background of my busy mind is the question Paul asks in Romans 8, verse 31. What then are we to say about these things? What then are we to say about a world turned upside down? About a virus that has spread around the world to 177 countries, already killing tens of thousands and sickening hundreds of thousands of people? about quarantines and stay-at-home rules and shelter in place and wash your hands and practice social distancing, and all the other sudden changes to our lifestyles, about layoffs and stock market craziness and record unemployment applications and $2 trillion emergency legislation and the official announcement that we are now in a recession, about healthcare workers rallying to be on the front line of community defense and hospitals without enough beds or equipment or personnel. What are we to say about flattening the curve? What then are we to say about where God is in all this and what God wants us to be doing in all this? and where we will all be in relation to God and one another and this precious earth when all this is over. What then are we to say about these things? Well, the first thing I think I need to say is that this is not the first time that humanity has faced a crisis of this magnitude. Understand we are still at the beginning of this crisis. It will get worse before it gets better. There will be enormous suffering and it's likely to play out for years to come in ripples across the waters of human experience around the globe. But this is not the first time humanity has faced such a crisis. And it is also not the first time that the church of Jesus Christ has faced a crisis and risen to the occasion. Suddenly, our message and our way of being are needed by the world. Suddenly, we are challenged to reorganize everything about the ways we gather, love, and serve, and suddenly, we are jolted into a spiritual journey we never expected to be on. And God is with us like a personal health crisis which awakens our prayer life, or a family loss which sends us to our knees, we are startled by how little we know, how small we are, and how our illusion of independence is just that, an illusion. We are intimately connected with every other living being on the planet, and we are utterly dependent upon God. So we look to our history and we ask how others survived and we listen to the witness that they give. It was in the 14th century that Christian mystic Julian of Norwich lived through recurrent devastations of the Black Death. And when she was on the verge of death herself, she experienced revelations of divine love. She survived her sickness and she wrote, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. 
not because she was naive about life and suffering. Oh, totally the contrary. But because she was given vision beyond the immediate horizon, and thus she knew God's steadfast, mighty love to be the power undergirding everything. Of her visions, she wrote this. From the time these things were first revealed, I had often wanted to know what was our Lord's meaning. It was more than 15 years after that I was answered in my spirit's understanding. You would know our Lord's meaning in this thing. Know it well. Love was his meaning. Who showed it to you? Love. What did he show you? Love. Why did he show it? For love. Hold on to this and you will know and understand love more and more, but you will not know or learn anything else ever. Julian of Norwich's answer to the question, what then shall we say about these things, is this, love. We're hearing a torrent of other words from a plethora of other experts, and believe me, we need the true experts and real science in this time. But the most important answer to our spiritual questions is Julian's, love. Similarly, Pastor Martin Rinkart served the city of Eilenburg in Saxony in the 17th century for 30 years, coinciding almost entirely with the Thirty Years' War. The series of wars brought famines and destruction. Refugees poured into the walled city, and then the plague struck killing 8,000 residents of the city, including the majority of the town council, a high percentage of the children, most of the neighboring clergymen, and Rinkert's own wife. This poor pastor was left to bury 40 to 50 people per day, a total approaching 5,000 people. And in the midst of all that sorrow and suffering, he wrote this. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices who wondrous things has done in whom this world rejoices who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. Rinkert's answer to the question, what then shall we say about these things, is faith and trust in the goodness and mercy of God. And then there is St. Paul, whose own life was nothing if not dramatic. In his second letter to the Corinthians, he enumerates his sufferings. He tells us he received 40 lashes five times. Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he was stoned with, by, in punishment. Three times he was shipwrecked, adrift at sea. He was in danger from rivers bandits, various peoples, hunger, thirst, exposure, and on top of all that, he had to worry about the churches. Paul was no stranger to life's difficulties. And yet, in his magnum opus, the letter to the Romans, he answers his own question. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He asks. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Will coronavirus 
or self-concerned politicians or toilet paper hoarders separate us from the love of Christ? Will corporate cronyism or corrupt congresspersons or crashes in our portfolios or even an economic depression which could last for years? Will the loss of loved ones or the overwhelming of our medical structure or the grief of an entire world undermine the love of God in Jesus Christ? Now, I am not minimizing the hardship we are facing as a world community. I am deeply troubled by the stories coming out of Italy and Spain, Seattle, and now New York City. Oh, I do grieve with those who are suffering. I want our government leaders to do better at staving off the advance of the disease. I pray for our scientists to achieve rapid breakthroughs in treatment and prevention of further outbreaks. For I believe that God has given us the gift of sound minds to solve these human problems, as well as the gift of leadership to coordinate the public response and the gift of compassion to care for and prioritize the least among us. I believe Christ has led us in the development of ethics, which can help us know which choices are God's choices. We have an enormous collective problem to address right now, and we are all in this together. One gift which Christians have is the gift of faith, that God's love is greater, stronger, and ultimately more powerful than all the forces of sin and death, evil and suffering that we see around us. This gift of faith is the gift of seeing beyond the immediate situation, beyond our limited horizon to the horizon of Christ. For we have Christ's life and death and resurrection to show us that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Not death, not life, not angels or rulers or things present or things to come, not powers or height or depth or anything else in all creation. My friends, dear ones, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny, as Martin Luther King Jr. would say. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And that is a good thing, a wonderful thing, a blessed thing, because the network of mutuality is the web of God's inescapable love. We are bound to one another because we are held together by God's love. That's the Christian message. That is the church's way of being. And it it is not limited by the walls of the church. It reaches out to all the world. What then are we to say about these things? Let us say what Christ's church has always been called to say, that nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. And then let us live in God's love using every power and gift God sends to love the world that God loves using all our hearts, souls, minds, and strengths. And may we sing and believe, Oh, may this bounteous God through all our life be near us with ever joyful heart and blessed peace to cheer us and 
and keep us in God's grace and guide us when perplexed and free us from all ills in this world and the next. Amen.